um, let me know when I should screen share. Got it, will do. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give folks a few minutes to hop on the webinar um, before we get started. So sit tight and get comfortable. Hello, everyone. We're going to give folks just one more minute to hop on. Um, we have in the chat the slides in case anyone would like to take notes that way. And I see some people are already introducing themselves in, their, in the chat. We love it. We'd love to know who's here. Feel free to put yourself there. It looks like attendance has started to, to level off. So I think it's we're in the clear to get started. Um, Blake, would you like to kick us off? Sure thing. Thank you, Mia. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy summer solstice. I am Blake Hush, the Training and Outreach Unit Chief at OBS. And as you can see on our screen, our director, Elizabeth Cronin, is also with us today. And she's going to offer some opening remarks. I'm just going to give a little webinar housekeeping first real quick. Today's webinar is one of many that we've offered through our OBS training and technical assistance request program, or TARP, which you're going to learn a little more about in just a minute here from me and the rest of the team. Um, for the last few years, we've hosted a series of webinars designed to help you tackle some of the unique challenges or, or unique circumstances that you're dealing with and that the programs you may be working for are facing. And, and today is no different. And we hope you get the most out of this training opportunity uh, from Rakesha, Allison, and Mia, who are amazing. You're going to love them. And this also happens to be one of our more high, highly uh, registered webinars we've offered. So sit back. We're excited you're joining us today. When After today's webinar, it is being recorded. It will be published and shared on our, our YouTube channel. We'll also email a link to all of the attendees. Uh, access to that as well. That, any previous recordings uh, from previous trainings we've done as well are also up there, and it's all easily accessible on our website on the obs.ny.gov forward slash training page, or even just searching OBS in the uh, YouTube channel, and that'll come up. And then finally, as you exit today's webinar, you'll be directed to an evaluation survey. We'll also have QR codes for you as well to be able to access it. Links will get shared in the chat. Do please take a couple of minutes to give us some feedback. We genuinely use that every time after a training and share feedback both with the, all of the facilitators or presenters, but as well as with us internally for planning purposes. So, you know, we've learned a sweet spot for offering webinars tends to be midweek, before lunch or after lunch. And that all came from direct feedback that you have provided from previous trainings you've done. So we genuinely appreciate that. And if there's something we can do better, we, we want to hear it. So take your time to give us a couple of minutes of feedback. That said, I'd like to officially welcome the Office of Victim Services Director, Elizabeth Cronin. Thanks so much, Blake. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, we're so grateful to be able to offer these um, webinars for you. And first, I want to say thanks to Blake and Rachel and the whole um, OBS training and outreach team. They do such an amazing job for us in um, organizing this series. And, you know, these programs come out of information that you're providing to us. You know, what it is that you're looking for, what it is, the challenges that you're facing and how um, we can help you through those challenges. And just looking at all the people who are saying hello, I mean, I think we have over 600 people signed up for this webinar, which is pretty amazing. 
And so obviously you really do want um, this programming, but it, I mean, it's really people from all different kinds of programs from systems-based to community-based and not-for-profits from Suffolk County all the way up to Northern New York and Western New York. I mean, it's really covering the state. And so even though a lot of what you see may be specific to your area, you're still facing a lot of the same challenges. So um, I'm thrilled to have our T TARP providers here. And so um, Mia and Allison are going to kick off um, Rokisha's program, and uh, we're all really looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so before we dive into the main topic of today, um, I wanted to just provide a very quick overview of the Training and Technical Assistance Request Program, or TARP. And that's because we have services that we can offer you all um, and they're completely free of charge and we want you to take advantage of them. So through this program TARP, individual victim assistance programs are able to request individualized training and individualized technical assistance. TTA through TARP can focus on a whole range of topics related to organi organizational leadership and communications. Um, we offer this TTA ourselves when we can. When we have consultants or partners that can offer it even stronger, we allow them to do so too. Again, these services are completely no cost to you. Um, there are a handful of types of offerings we provide here. Allison, you can go to the next slide. And we put here just a few examples. Um, you can see more examples and more overarching topics at our catalog. The TARP catalog is available on the OBS website, um, and it really dives into what kind of training and support we can offer you. And it also has a section that says, hey, if there's something in these categories that, or you have something outside of these categories that you need support in, we can try to explore that too. Um, so to request this program um, and to request this individualized TTA, your executive director or program director, Allison, I'll have you go to the next slide. Um, your executive director or program director can go to our course catalog, click a service or a topic, and submit a request. Um, we can show you that catalog on the next, the next slide. And once you submit that request, we are able to see it on our end. We reach out to you, we set up a planning call, and we get the process started. So it's very simple, it's very hands-on, and really we're here to support your needs. Um, as they change and grow. So with that, I'll transition us back to the topic of today, which is self-care and supervision for sustainability, managing self and up with a trauma-informed DEI lens. I'm very excited to offer this uh, webinar for you all today alongside my colleagues, Allison Diegas and Rakesha Ford. Um, Allison is a program director here, and Rakesha is also a program director, and the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer here at ISLG. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to Allison to further introduce herself and get her get the webinar started. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Really excited to spend the next hour and a half with you. And I wanted to sort of invite everyone to be as interactive as possible in the chat and the Q&A. Um, I know with these large webinars, sometimes it could become very one, dir one directional. And we want to have this be as engaging and bi-directional as possible. So please use those chat, use the chat option, ask your questions in the Q&A section. Um, we're really excited to chat with you. So, and bear with me as I try and remember how to use PowerPoint because it apparently is stuck. There we go, all right. Um, so to start, what do we mean by managing self and managing up? Uh, today we're going to explore practices for managing ourselves and managing up within our organizations and within our work. But we do want to pause and clarify what we mean when we say these terms, recognizing that there are a lot of definitions out there. These aren't, the, I'm sure this is not the first time that you've heard these terms. Um, and we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So. As I mentioned, people define these terms in a lot of different ways. To us, managing self is about the relationship we have with ourselves in our work. It's about how we care for ourselves, how we manage our time and responsibilities in a way that make our work sustainable, 
It's about how we achieve wellness in the short and the long term. And it's the intentional ways that we hold onto our effectiveness, our curiosity and joy amidst everything else that is going on in this really difficult work that we do. And then managing up in term is about the relationship that we have with our supervisors and organizations and how we use that relationship to achieve our goals, um, our goals for ourselves and our goals for our clients. Um, it involves expressing our needs and then getting those needs met in partnership with leadership. And over the course of the next hour and a half, we're gonna dive into this a bit more um, and, and, and also chat a bit about how to do this. So why now, right? We've been around a long time. Um, we've been doing this work for a while. And you might be asking about why is this important now, given all of the things that we have to deal with in this universe and within our work, why is this something that it's worth taking time to, to think about and to process? And, and frankly, it's been a really hard few years. And I, I don't mean to say that it was easier prior to a few years ago, but the complexities of the work just kind of added on, right? between burnout in the victim services field, the impacts of COVID-19, we just don't, we don't have to list out all of the ways that VAPs are facing growing challenges. Um, we're all doing a lot more with a lot less as the needs of our communities and the people we serve keep growing and keep becoming more complicated, but the resources that we have available to us aren't growing along with those needs. And all of these challenges just make the work that much harder, leaving us as individuals more susceptible to burnout and more vulnerable to vicarious trauma. There is a lot that we don't have control over, uh, but there are still some things that we can do as individuals to better sustain ourselves in this work. And that's what we wanna focus on today. There are real benefits to being strategic and intentional with how we build positive relationships, both with ourselves and with our leadership and then how we use these relationships to be effective and healthy and satisfied in our roles. So on that note, here's a agenda or a run of show for what to expect. Um, we're gonna check in with ourselves for a few minutes, chat about 10, 15 minutes about managing self, then we'll move to managing up, um, and then we'll spend some time chatting about DEI or um, diversity, equity, inclusion and considerations in doing all of this. And um, we'll try and save some time at the end for questions, but please don't wait for the end. As I said, jump into the chat, jump into the Q&A. So checking in, um, let's use that chat. Um, we'd love to hear what you all think about when you hear the words managing self um, and when you hear the terms managing up. That could be your own personal reaction, positive or negative. It could be other trainings you've been to. It could be assumptions you have, whatever it is. Where are you coming from when you hear these terms? And um, you know what brought you here today? I see self-regulation and taking care of me. Um, a lot of self-regulation, managing self-emotional intelligence. Relationships is a really big thing, right? Managing relationships with others, um, managing and, and, and what and all of the resources that can bring. Boundaries is really important. These are great. Self accountability. Um, keep these answers coming. I love this. Um, and me and Rakesha, jump in if I'm missing anything as they come through because I am, as it turns out, not super fluid in technology. Yet more boundaries for self and others, responses to stress and interactions, relationship, this is great. And then managing up, making sure to communicate needs when you need assistance with supervisors, trying to move forward on DEI work with leadership and within agencies. This is all fantastic. How you communicate with supervisors for managing up. Yes, thank you and stating your needs when they're not being met. That's really important. Monitoring that communication with supervisors and peers and keeping a solution focused mindset. I love all of these, thank you. And please keep on jumping in. Um, we'll you know, move a little bit forward as we chat a little bit more about what this is. And I try and remember again, how to use 
There we go. All right. Um, I think my computer hates me. All right. So about managing ourselves. Um, as we shared before, managing self is a practice for ensuring long-term wellness and sustainability. And managing self can look like a lot of things. So, you know, I think the chat had a bunch of really great examples. And I'm going to inadvertently copy you if that's okay, because we share some of those same examples. It's about building positive self-narratives about our worthiness and our achievements. It's about advocating for our needs. There were a lot of examples in the chats about um, talking about what you need and telling your supervisors and asking for help where you need it, um, engaging in regular self-care, building and maintaining achievable calendars and to-do lists, um, and you know, appreciating that that's really difficult when we're overwhelmed and feeling underwater because again, greater needs, fewer resources, but still really important to kind of manage. Taking lunch breaks, um, we forget about ourselves and, and taking that time to eat and sustain ourselves physically is really important and unfortunately something that we forget a lot. Um, and then honestly blocking out our time for our, on our calendars to make sure we have time during the workday um, to do paperwork and keep up with your notes so you're not sitting in the office until 11 o'clock at night at the end of the month when you know stats are due or going in on a weekend to try and keep up because things are crazy, right? Just making sure you have the time to get things done. And on that note, we wanna make a quick note about what managing self is not. Um, Cause we wanna be clear that managing self is not something that we do, which removes an organization's responsibility to also care for our staff. Um, organizations are still and will always be responsible for using trauma-informed practices with their teams as much as with their clients, with each other, and for making sure that our roles are sustainable, helping us manage our workload. Um, and but, but even given the role and the responsibilities of organizations in doing this, managing self can still help us. It can help us be accountable to ourselves. It can help us be intentional about committing to practices that make this work joyful and sustainable. Um, and it's really important to engage in those trauma-informed self-management practices. You know, as I mentioned, we have to be trauma-informed organizations. We have to be also trauma-informed with ourselves, but we'll dive into that a bit more in a moment. So to that end, we've kind of created four principles that we believe build a solid foundation for healthy and practical self-management. And these are by no means the only principles. They're just the ones that we wanted to highlight today in this conversation. If over the course of our conversation, it's obvious that there's a principle that's really important to you that's missing, please throw it in the chat. We would really love to pull from your brains and so we can chew on that kind of in the side in the chat and then also afterwards. Um, and we're going to really quickly run through these um, principles and then turn to an example where we can kind of take these principles into a more tangible and grounded practice using actual tools and, and sort of a, a fake real world example. So first we have self-reflection and self-reflection allows us to understand our own needs, our interactions, and to that end, how we interact with others. I encourage you to find time and space to understand for yourself, what are we feeling and why do we feel that way? It's particularly important when you work in high stress situations, understanding what's happening and why allows us to manage those feelings and not misplace them. Um, when, when we do misplace them, there are sometimes consequences, right? Um, we're really upset with ourselves, we're really overwhelmed and frustrated, we're feeling burnt out, and then we, we start blaming someone else, we're blaming ourselves, we start harming relationships, it impacts our work with our clients, with our supervisors, our relationships with our families outside of work, and all of that just makes it harder to manage the workload and it becomes this ongoing cycle. Another thing we want to kind of sit and think about is what brings us to this work and what gives us self-fulfillment, because sometimes that self-fulfillment piece 
adds that little bit of energy and positive framing that helps throughout the day. And then the act of self-reflection is often coupled with managing the feelings that are tied to that. We tell our clients about mindfulness and deep breathing, but these are skills we should practice for ourselves as well. When we're feeling frustrated and underwhelmed ident or overwhelmed, identify that and, and doing what we need to kind of push through the moment and take care of ourselves. Um, so that's self-reflection. The next is self-advocacy. Um, we know we heard some of this in the chat, but self-advocacy refers to the ways in which we're tuned into those needs that we have, that we express those needs to others, and how, to, um, how we could commit to tangible practices to getting those needs met. Self-advocacy can look like bringing a detailed agenda to your weekly supervisor check-in, and then on the agenda, having an ask for them, um, what's something you need from them as a supervisor, as an organization, and spelling it out, documenting that, and really bringing the case of this is a this is the challenge, this is the problem, and I need you to step in and help me by doing X or by doing Y. Self-advocacy can look like setting boundaries that keep you safe in this role and then holding to those boundaries with care when they're broken by, by family, by colleagues, by clients. Um, those boundaries are healthy and are ways to protect ourselves. Um, and then, you know, we say this recognizing that self-advocacy can also be really tricky and complicated. We'll dive into more tangible practices for self-advocacy a bit later in the pre um, presentation, but we do want to acknowledge that the, there are politics in the room, there's relationships to manage, there are a lot of moving pieces, um, and all of those things are going to be present when we are reflecting and talking about self-advocacy, so we do want to acknowledge that it's, it's not always that simple. The next one, kind of to that end, is self-forgiveness. Um, and wanting to kind of take a step back and just sort of state that shame is a really normal emotion. And it often goes hand in hand with trauma and burnout. Um, I'm sure that's depending on the work that some of you do, concept of shame as it relates to um, different forms of healing and different responses around violence is something that comes up. I know that it's something that I've heard a lot in the abusive partner world. And there are reasons for that. You know, there's within the work that we do, there's the shame that we couldn't do more. There's the shame of an interaction that we had with family, with coworkers and clients. Um, there's, you know, a shame of a type of mistake that we've made in the work and whatever came of that. And when shame is present for so many of us, it can really further those harmful interactions with others and with ourselves. So it's important that we allow ourselves to forgive ourselves for our mistakes, for the things that we're not able to do, that we don't have the power to do. You know, we're human, we have limits, and that's okay. Um, but giving ourselves within that self-reflection, recognizing when you did your best and it's always good enough and kind of stepping away from, you know, from that shame and that those, 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 those things that pull us in the wrong direction. The other thing is that when we're able to forgive ourselves, we're also more easily able to forgive others, our coworkers, our clients, our family, our friends. You know, we all have battles that we're fighting and the self uh, forgiveness helps us navigate that, helps us to build empathy for those that we care about or those that we work with, um, which can kind of leading to our next section, our next uh, principle, help build that collaboration and peer support. And, you know, you'll notice that this last one, collaboration and peer support, is the only principle we have that doesn't begin with the word self, and, and that's intentional. We wanted to include this here because managing self isn't always on you and isn't only something, isn't something that only you can do. Um, Self-management also refers to the ways that we lean on our peers for support, the way that we call on coworkers when managing a difficult case, and the ways that you partner with leadership and coworkers when you're feeling underwater. Um, I'm sure we all have stories about times when 
someone is out or when there's a crisis and you're able to lean on this coworker to help pick up the slack here, you know, those relationships are really great in the short term and kind of intentionally fostering them can help us in the long term and really improve the resources that we do have available. So on that note, we're gonna engage in a little bit of storytelling. Um, this is Zoe, she's imaginary. Um, and Zoe um, recently had an experience that I think that all of us who have worked in the field, worked in nonprofits, worked in social service sector at some point have experienced. So I'm gonna read it. Mia is gonna plant it in the chat for um, folks who are more visual learners than um, uh, oral learners. I know I'm, I'm, I'm very visual myself. And then we'll move on to um, some questions to kind of just chew on what's going on with Zoe. So Zoe's a senior case manager at a medium-sized nonprofit serving her region in New York State. Her team was recently reduced from five people to four people. And so now together, she and her coworkers are responsible for providing both crisis response and case management services across the entire region which covers a very large city and then several nearby suburbs. Typically, the team serve 450 cases a year across the used to be five, now four people. But last year, a partner agency shut down and the result was another 150 cases coming through her program each year. So now they're looking at 600 cases for four people, for longer term work with people who have an incredible amount of need and their caseloads have shot up dramatically. So last Thursday wasn't great. Um, Zoe came into the office at 10 in the morning for the start of her shift to find out that a, a client, current client of hers was sitting in the lobby in crisis, had been waiting for an hour without any of her coworkers checking in. And then there were two more cases sitting and waiting for intake, but it wasn't Zoe's intake day. A coworker of hers was out sick again. And so now Zoe stepped up to fill in the intake role while also meeting her client who was in crisis and doing all the other work she had planned for that day. Um, so by the time she got to her desk, she already had eight voicemails from clients and an email from her supervisor asking why her case notes were up to date and it just wasn't great. So she didn't get out of there until 8.30 at night. And the next morning when she came back in, she started complaining loudly to another caseworker who hadn't been there, I guess, the day before, but just complaining about how their coworker was out, how she feels like the coworker's always out and accused the coworker of pretending to be sick to avoid those intake days and leaving her to carry the burden of all of the intakes plus. Um, so the following week, that coworker ended up not invited out with the team when they grabbed lunch or made a coffee run and was just sort of cut out of it. So on that note, here are some questions. And, you know, we brought that example to the table, which is obviously not a true story, but transparently one that we've all, I think, experienced and heard or some version of it. And would love to spend some time in the chat. And I don't know, Mia, are we able to unmute people? I believe we are. If an attendee raises their hand, we can unmute. So if anyone feels the need to jump in also to kind of just let's talk about what do we think was going on for Zoe given those four principles of self-management. Um, what was going on for her that day? What was maybe going on for her coworkers? Um, when we think about forgiveness, what do we think we even be going on for Zoe around self-forgiveness that day um, or the following days? Um, are there opportunities for self-advocacy? And if so, what are they? Um, peer support, what are good examples of peer support and what could have been better? in terms of how we use peer support. And then when we think about how Zoe handled it, if we think she handled it well, what went well? If we think she could have handled it better, what do we think are some of the consequences for how she handled it? Um, and how? what is something that she can do next? Um, 
I'm going to attempt the chat. I'm going to read out a few things in the chat. Mia, if you also want to jump in with what you're seeing, because sure. feedback is coming in fast, but I'm sure. seeing overwhelmed, compassion fatigue or burnout and feeling taken advantage of. I'm seeing burnout amplified like 900 times, which is great because, yep, I feel that too. <laughs> Um, that she and her team are all overworked, feelings of displacement onto her sick coworker due to being overworked and overwhelmed, um, not feeling seen or heard or lack of support. Mia, do you want to jump in with a few? Yeah, something I noticed that um, stood out to me is someone said maybe the coworker was out sick because they're also overworked and burned out. And that ties to the, you know, what is sustainability? when managing self and how does the way I manage myself contribute or harm another person's sustainability and just being mindful that we're, we're all in this, we're all struggling. What are intentional ways we can be working together, asking for our needs from supervisors rather than working against each other. I love that. Thanks, Mia. My, yeah. And I see also a comment to your point about like speaking to supervisor and distributing about how to better distribute duties and caseloads so that it is more manageable and then work with our coworkers to what's the best way to distribute work when someone's absent. Um, Mia, do you see any other like really great, because I know we'll be shifting to managing up. So really great examples of managing up that we want to pull out right now. Absolutely. I hear just a lot of, or I read a lot of talking to the supervisor, bringing transparency and saying, what is the practice here? You know, is there a limit to how many cases I can intake in a month? Um, what kind of standards can we put in place and how can we approve of those, you know, as a team? Um, so I think what I'm seeing is in the chat is really tangible ways of trying to get this sorted out with the individual supervisor rather than with the peer or with, you know, even worse, other peers um, that aren't in the room for that. That's great. And one other kind of observation I want to throw out is just sort of this question of fairness for um, Zoe's coworkers and was it fair to blame um, and what was going on behind that. And I think I'm seeing consensus, consensus that there's clearly a lot of burnout. And what's happening is that burnout is being displaced by blaming the coworker who was out sick, possibly because they're sick, possibly because they're burnt out too. Um, and that need to then manage, you know, instead of kind of attacking our peers, building community with peers and then turning to supervisors and organizations to help sort through all of that and, and, and look at whether it be systems or policies, but what's going on to kind of help make our work more sustainable and manageable um, to prevent that burnout. I think, Allison, the only piece I'm not seeing too much in the chat, actually, one just came up now about forgiving herself. Um, so is there any Love way it. you want to speak to that? I'll add, Christy said, forgiving herself could look like realizing her behavior towards her coworker was due to her own stress and apologize to the coworker and work on how to manage her reactions to others. So that's I great. Think that's, that's great. Three strategies um, all wrapped up in forgiving herself. For the burnout that, that she's experiencing. Thanks so much for catching that, Mia. I love that. I think that's exactly right. And I wouldn't be surprised where if also, you know, I'm sure Zoe walked in with a plan that day for how she could help all of her clients and, and what she could do, and she wasn't able to do it. Um, and how does that feel when we know there are um, people that we're working with who need something from us and need us to do something and we're not able to get to it because of all of these other things. We're not able to commit our full like attention to the person in front of us. There are so many ways that when we're burnt out and overwhelmed, it impacts the work itself. Um, and sometimes, sometimes we feel pretty bad about that and can start blaming others as opposed to forgiving ourselves because we're doing the best we have. The best we can. I love it. So on that note, I'm going to move to the next section and well, I'm gonna see if this thing listens to me. There we go. All right, so before we like move on to managing up, um, 
Are there any questions that folks want to jump in on? Raise your hand um, so we can see if that works, if you want to ask out loud or any kind of big questions in the chat. Allison, we did catch one. This was from a few minutes ago, um, but I caught it in the chat. Someone said, when I and some peers were hired at my agency, we were told by a supervisor that, quote, we don't do lunch breaks here. How do you manage yourself and up an environment that seems to not foster practicing the care you need during the day? That is complicated. So I think there are a couple of things. And then um, in terms of like specific, let's connect offline. But, you know, one part of it is kind of bringing and documenting those concerns lunch breaks are required in New York State. So if, you know, there are folks joining us from all over the country, but if you're at least in New York State, there are expectations and laws around lunch and eating. So working with your peers, working with your supervisors, documenting that and gaining documentation and kind of taking it from there. Um, and kind of figuring out what is the boundary when we think about those self boundaries to make sure that when you don't have a um, a work environment that allows you to more fully take care of yourself, if you if you will, um, creating the boundaries around your day to make sure that you're still able to take care of yourself and your team. Any others? We have some hands. I'm gonna um, invite Stephanie to talk. Stephanie, you should be able to join us. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for that. I'm wondering if this situation does not also lend itself to managing up because there seemingly was no management involvement in how the, the case mat workers were operating. And that that missing element could well solve Zoe's problems and the other workers' problems. So I'll leave it there with you. I think that's a really great observation. And I'm going to ultimately uh, punt it to Mia in the next section. But I think you're right. There was definitely, I'm going to say, a lot of opportunities for management to have to step in and figure out processes that are better and sustainable, you know, again, we're all doing a lot more with less, but there are ways that supervisors and organizations can make sure that folks still have what they need, um, to make sure that they're able to take their lunch, make sure that there's appropriate and adequate and fair coverage strategies, um, and kind of managing all of that and how to have that conversation, we'll chat a bit more about in the next section. Right, and I'm happy to jump into more, you know, tangible ways of doing this too, which is what the next section is about. But I also see that Vivian's hand is raised. Um, and so Vivian, we're gonna invite you to join us. You should be able to now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't have uh, I didn't have anything to say. I think I checked that by mistake. So that is that is okay, and that allows us to go from Stephanie's point right to the next section, and it's a good segue. So um, I'll shift now to managing up, um, which is the second piece of this presentation today. And managing self again, it refers to the relationship we have with our supervisor and how we use that supervisor to get our needs met. Um, and how to serve our clients well and sustainably. So on the next slide, um, we have just a few pieces of managing up kind of broadly before we get into the specifics. So it's important to name that healthy and productive supervision is bi-directional. Um, what we mean by that is that you bring questions to supervisors, they answer, they find ways to support you, and you are accountable to them just as much as they are accountable to you. That's healthy and productive. Um, and again, we use it as a tool for meeting our needs. That might look like coming to check-ins with agendas, as Allison mentioned. Um, that might um, entail having 
weekly check-ins with yourself where you name what worked that week, what didn't, and you bring them to them. Um, so on the next slide, let's start going into, you know, what this work actually looks like. So the first piece we have is holding regular check-ins. And that sounds fairly simple, and that's because it is. Um, holding regular check-ins is absolutely critical to maintaining that open communication and that consistency with your supervisor. I know from my case planning days that supervision could very easily be the last thing on my list, let alone my supervisors. And especially when the, the people I was working with were in crisis. Um, but it's so important that when your caseload is high, when your notes are behind, to still have those supervision moments because you need that support, especially in those high intensity times. Um, so the first thing we have here is determining the right frequency. You know, how often do I need supervision? What is my, my style in receiving supervision? Do I like having a 30 minute weekly call where we just boom, 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 go through the top priorities? Or I do, do I like an hour every other week where we can really flesh out and problem solve together? The second piece we have is trying to always hold them no, ma no matter how busy you are. Um, Allison, did you have something to add? No, no, I'm oh, telling computer issues. That is okay. Um, and preparing by making strategic, intentional agenda. We'll go into specifics on the next slide, but for now I'll say it's really worthwhile to get in the habit of spending 15 minutes a week um, before your supervision preparing for the check-in. You know, what are my top priorities? What are my burning questions? What challenges do I see around the corner? Um, and where can I ask for support? And I'll say from experience, the more I prepared for check-ins, the more I started to shift the way I viewed my caseload um, as where can I bring in supervisors? Where do I need them? Where do I not need them? It shifted my thinking throughout the work week so that I was always thinking to that next Tuesday check-in um, and what I would need and uh, what my clients may need. The fourth we have is working together to determine priorities. Um, because it's important to say when we add things to our list, other things need to come off. It's never that simple. Um, everything kind of by nature of the work is high priority, but that's why you have a supervisor to sit down and say, okay, what can I push to next week? What can I deprioritize? Is there someone else in my office struggling with this? And can I partner with them on Friday for an hour after lunch to get it done? Um, problem solving for challenges together and identifying again those areas for support. And then the last piece we have here is inviting feedback. Um, we mentioned earlier that important and healthy and productive relationships with supervisors do have that bi-directional feedback. So if we go to the next slide, Allison, um, I'll say that the bi-directional feedback can look like a lot of different words. It can look like a lot of different timings and we're open to all of that. Um, so we have here a bunch of strategies for what you can actually do in managing up in a supervision or in a check-in. There's a lot on here. I encourage you to take a picture or check out the slides later. Um, but for now, I'm gonna focus on a few. And the first is that uh, feedback piece. Um, something that we've all found helpful even in ISLG is being proactive about requesting feedback. You know, coming into a supervision saying, I noticed on that last visit that I got kind of escalated quickly or got triggered a little quickly. Did you notice places that I could have stepped back or um, strategies I could have used to stay present, for example? Or I found that conference call to go really well with the family. Um, did you leave that call thinking the same? And the reason why questions like that are important, you know, pending the kind of relationship you have with your supervisor is because it removes the guessing game. Um, it can help mitigate that shame for when you do step in a direction you didn't want to step. Working together to make sure that when you're in a similar situation, you might be more prepared to react differently. Again, this is all pens the kind of relationship you have with your supervisor and your supervisor supervisor style. So we don't want to pretend like this is, you know, a catch all every relationship. This will work, but there are ways you can try to build it in casually into your relationship. Um, 
The last thing on the slide I'll flag too is just prioritizing tasks. The reality is you're, um, you have very high caseloads and you have a lot to do every day. And being intentional about saying, realistically, I have X amount of hours of notes I have to do these visits. I have, you know, whatever your work looks like. Um, I also have a court deadline. Where can the work be flexed? You know, where can I add time? If I do a long day this Friday, can I have a late start on Monday? I need rest, you know? So just talking a little creatively about what flexibility looks like and what deprioritization looks like. Um, so just pausing here quickly, are there any reactions or questions in the chat or a hand raised um, to this piece about you know, strategies while you're in the supervision or in the check-in? We have no questions. This is all just very good and very helpful advice. That's great to hear. Something I didn't touch on that I heard some positive feedback at the start of the call was the collaboration and peer support piece. So under tactical, we have the identify the right partners and team members to get things done. That's partly a supervisor's role. Um, you don't have to hold all of that navigation and hold all of those relationships. You can go to them and say, you know, I'm working with the case manager and the therapist and the crisis worker and X is coming up. What do we do? Or what advice do you have for me in navigating my next call with their therapist? You know, being just transparent about what's going on. And that will also show your supervisor that you're thinking creatively um, to get the problem solved too. We also have awesome in the chat, love to hear that. What advice would you give about how to do these things while navigating, navigating different supervision styles? I'll say that in a role I had previously in the direct services field, I had a few different leaders with very different styles. And what I found was that I had to be strategic about where I brought different issues, you know, who I brought those issues to. Sometimes that looked like bringing it to a peer because that's what the situation required. I was most safe bringing it to a peer. And that's what I would do. A peer that maybe had more experience than me, so it felt like supervision, or a peer that had been in the field longer or that organization longer, um, or someone with fresher eyes. Um, there's a lot of turnover where I was at before, and sometimes I would bounce ideas off of the newer folks too. Um, and then also when going to, you know, different leaders saying there's a relationship building piece that I really, I get along well with this leader when, man, when talking about those things, I'll go to them. But when it comes to notes and some of the non-negotiables, I go to this person. Um, that would be my advice off the top of my head. Allison, Rokisha, feel free to jump in. We have what if it's your supervisor who is out of line with their verbal behaviors and made racist verbal insults, and that's what makes it hard to get peer support. And what do you do when HR says it's just a, quote, different supervision style? I think that the reality is something like this can be managed offline and talk through, you know, because that's, there's HR involvement, there's sensitivities, there's race and equity involved. Um, I think that that's something that we can talk with offline, but off the top of your, my head, there are, you have rights, you have, like Allison said, lunch breaks. There are policies you can lean on in moments like that, um, but I encourage you to connect offline. I'm gonna jump in also just to sort of acknowledge. So when we think about workplaces, there are, Kind of there's a there's a best case scenario and a worst case scenario and then everything in between right so you have a best case scenario where you have supervisors and management who are present who care about the work who everyone has their own style everyone makes mistakes not everyone might be the strongest in terms of management skills and supervisory skills there's a lot of personality and personality quirks and burnout. So we have to kind of navigate that. And to the earlier question, 
adapt our approaches? Is this someone who kind of needs to think they came up with an idea? So we're going to kind of slowly nudge them in the right direction of what we need? Or is this someone who you really have two minutes of their time, but if you're like, I need X, they give you X, right? And you kind of, you use that checking in and kind of like empathy piece to get a sense of who are they and what they need. On the other end of the spectrum, there are just work environments that have problems that kind of go a little bit beyond simply managing up. Um, when we start talking about bias and discrimination, HR issues, employment laws, and possible violations of employment laws. And that's where, you know, we are not experts on that. Um, if there are questions, we're happy to connect offline and point you in a direction of someone who might be, you know, a better person to talk to. But I do want to acknowledge, you know, we do have, you know, there are employment laws and, and, and rights within our work. Um, and when there's an employer that isn't that isn't living up to what they need to live up to, um, it's a broader conversation um, be, uh, that goes a little beyond managing self and managing up. Thank you, Allison. We've got one more question in um, the Q and A that might be worth the discussion before moving on to the next piece. Um, and that question is what I think about when hearing, quote, managing up, I think of people beneath someone keeping them on track. It can get exhausting. How do I navigate moving towards this direction that you mentioned of managing up? Allison, I don't know if there, I know you and I talked about this beforehand, if you have any feedback here. Yeah, so, you know, I was actually like had this open on my screen and was chewing on it um, and thinking about the best way to approach. So, and I'd love um, for Rakisha to also weigh in because I know this is something that she's spoken about and kind of navigating that. So, you know, there is definitely a component of managing up can end up being kind of managing our managers um, to kind of keep them going, but that also it, you know, we say that acknowledging that there's a lot of labor there. Um, one strategy that I found is including those managers who sometimes need managing, um, really understanding what their strengths are and starting from there. Um, what, what are the things that catch their interest? What are they particularly good at? Um, and, you know, again, being firm around those boundaries and, and really clear. So if, just coming up with an exa a made up example, if you need your supervisor to, um, let's, let's go to the Zoe example. If there is no process to make sure that there's an on-call policy around coverage. If there's no policy and process around coverage that's fair and equitable, they need to create that policy. So, you know, there's there's an element of kind of pushing them to do their jobs by creating that policy. But it's also saying like, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna create a boundary of myself. I'm not going to volunteer to be the intake person every single day. Um, and instead just keep bringing up, we need a policy, we need a practice. Here's what it can look like working with peers to kind of manage them in that way. So it's, you know, it's starting with what do I need and how do I get there? Depending on that manager, it can sometimes feel like you're doing the labor for, um, but also being really mindful of that and creating boundaries around. I hope that helps. Um, but Rakisha, is there something that I, I know we've kind of spoken about this in the past, if there's anything that you wanna add? Yeah, I'll chime in for a quick second because I'm also reading some of the comments. And I think one thing um, <clears throat> that we haven't mentioned yet, um, and this is part of managing self, um, is the piece where you, the, and it's part of the self-reflection, right? We don't have to always be where we are. <clears throat> so if our, our values are not aligned with that of an organization or an agency or whomever, that's something we need to take into consideration and think about and say, well, maybe this is not a good fit. And this is, of course, 
to Allison's note about, you know, there's discrimination, there's laws, there's legalities, and there's all of those pieces. I was just mentioning that as the other piece, Alice, Allison, but there's been instances, I mean, I'm in my third career, right? Because there were just some places that would, did not align with my values. Um, people were wonderful, the work was wonderful, but there was just a misalignment. And I had to make an executive decision for myself, for my own self-care, to move on into another location because my values were not aligned. And it's okay to make those decisions as well. And that's to speak about even when you're talking about, well, there's certain battles we have to fight. We're not gonna sit back and allow ourselves to be discriminated against or disrespected or legal actions. But then there's a piece about managing self where how are we spending our time? If there is a toxic environment, are we spending our time like, documenting and doing all of these things. And is that how we want to spend our time? And that's a personal decision. Um, there's been instances that I've been in where I've had to go the legal route for some, some situations. And then there were instances where I said, this is not worth my time, my energy, or my health. I will bring myself and my talents and my strengths elsewhere. And that's an okay decision also. And that is part of self-managing self and self-care. And the piece about managing up, because I've also had those experiences in during my tenure as a high school principal, it was very difficult to manage over 200 adults. And in some instances, 4,000 young people. And I had to have a very solid team of people to help me stay on track. Um, and I'm gonna use Allison's example about Zoe who didn't have, there clearly wasn't a, a case management process in place. So, a lot of people will sit back and wait for the manager, talk about the manager, complain about how the manager has not created this, this um, process. And a piece of advice that I would lend is, if it is within your bandwidth, instead of allowing yourself to go through all of these frustrations, and I think Mia is talking about this in the tactical area of the managing up check-ins, you know, maybe that's something that you and your manager could work together to hopefully decrease your workload so that you don't feel that you're totally and completely managing your um, boss or keeping them in check all the time. I do say, again, I've been on both sides, right? I've been on sides where I've had to manage a lot of people at once and having a solid team that I could trust that could help me accomplish my goals was equally as important. But I also had a piece, and I used to say this in schools, if you don't feed the teachers, then they'll eat the children. So I took very good care of my staff and my team because I needed them to be able to complete their, their work. But I also it was bi-directional. And I think that Mia is driving that home um, with this piece. It's a bi-directional piece. So if you're willing to manage up in a proper way, but you have a supervisor or a boss who's not on the same page, that's something that needs to be discussed, talked about, and reflected upon in your own personal um, career um, for your own goals. So I'll stop right there for a moment because we're gonna talk a little bit more about this even when we get to the DEI component of the training. Thank you, Rakisha. Um, we've got one more slide that I'll go through very quickly so that we have time to shift to the DEI considerations. Um, so the last piece we have is about setting expectations together. Um, here we have, we put together some version of a tool that you all can use, make your own um, when bringing a question or a challenge to a supervisor and working through that solution together and the expectations for those solutions together. So I'll read through them quickly. You can ask your supervisor, what is the end goal or expectation? Sometimes it's so easy to just look ahead and skip the basic questions like, wait, what are we actually doing here? What would success actually mean here? Um, what are we working towards? And then saying, what do I need to know? Um, depending on your role, this may be more or less relevant, but sometimes the supervisor has a longer relationship with that client. Um, sometimes they have information about policies behind um, the challenge you're trying to solve. So just saying, taking a moment to kind of gather what information do I offer what information do they offer? So it's all on the table. Then shifting towards um, what are other team members' roles here? You know, it's not always you on an island doing every single thing for your case, for your caseload. Um, 
again, that's relevant to some roles more than others, but it's okay to pause and make a habit of saying, where else can I get support? Um, who else's expertise can I lean on? That's part of working in an organization. Um, next, what is the timeline? Making sure that you're clear on expectations so that you don't get an email in two weeks um, with high importance in the exclamation point saying, where is this thing quarters tomorrow? Hello. Having that clear from the beginning. Um, then going to, what do I need to prioritize or deprioritize? We talked through that a little bit um, at the earlier in the presentation. If I'm adding this to the list, where am I removing things from the list? Making that open and transparent. And then if you'd like, if you have the bandwidth, if you have the answers saying, here's a process that I'm imagining for getting this done. How does this process sound to you? This relates to the feedback. Um, this relates to the bi-directional feedback of staying on the same page. I'll flag before passing it to Rakisha that this might sound a little corporate um, and might sound a little like sterile, but the reason is that there are tangible pieces of knowledge that you can get um, to get the job done and to remove all that thinking power and all that brainstorming power of you sitting at your desk answering voicemails and also strategizing at the same time. Um, making time to do that in a structured way together could help release help release um, some tensions and burnout tendencies. So with that, um, I think we can, the next slide is a pause for questions, but we already dived into a few and I think it's important to get to Rokisha's piece. So Rokisha, I'll pass it to you for the considerations. Thank you so much, Mia, that was wonderful. <clears throat> And such a great segue into DEI principles and considerations. And I just want to flag that DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I'm sure all of us on this webinar are aware. But we're moving into an area now where DEI is evolving more into diversity, equity, and belonging. And I mentioned that because I think that fits very nicely with what we're talking about today is managing self and managing up in that everybody has the right and deserve the right to feel like they belong in their workplace. Um, we're not just here as worker bees, especially because we're all working with people to accomplish a goal. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and that's something I'm even gonna bring to my organization is changing our DEI title to diversity, equity, and belonging. Um, and Mia, you can go to the next slide. or Allison, sorry about that. You know, so it's I, me, my, and I'm sorry to everybody. My computer apparently needs me to hit the button nine times to advance a slide, so bear with me. It's all good. We, we definitely understand. I definitely understand that personally. So we talked today about managing self and managing up. There are a few um, DI proficiencies or considerations, and as you'll see from this chart here, some of them will go across both. Um, DEI world is a never ending world. There's so much to learn and we're not going to be able to capture everything here. Um, but I thought I, it would be best to pull out some of the main pointers that I think and I hope would be helpful to you as you consider as you're managing self and managing up. And if you look at uh, managing self and managing up across both, you're gonna see understanding power dynamics. This is a big, big important piece because we need to know who's running the show, who's not, uh, whose voices have the most impact. And power dynamics, as we all know, stems from dismantling the idea of white supremacy and typical cisgender white male power dynamics. So it's also very important to understand manage, um, power dynamics and managing self and managing up. And we're gonna break, get into both of these a little more, but I just wanted to show you the chart. Identifying and addressing implicit biases, understanding how power and privilege affect our approach and our effectiveness, um, our self-management and emotional intelligence. I saw someone put that in the chat a little earlier. And then ideas around distributive authority. And that's gonna talk a little bit about special um, tool that you can use, especially if you're managing up. Um, and ethics of care. And we spoke about that with everything that we said with self-forgiveness, especially in this line of work, self-reflection, all of those pieces that we mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, and for managing up, one of the things that I've added is understanding work styles and preferences. 
Um, and that we're gonna talk a little bit more about as well, but that is an important piece. And I think someone mentioned it earlier that it's so important for in, in a bi-directional way, the person who is the manager and the person who's being managed that you both need to understand each other's work styles and what works best for them. Um, and we'll talk more about that as it relates to emotional intelligence. Um, and then understanding people's decision-making skills, understanding how people's brain works and how they make decisions. Um, that's gonna be also very important when we think about our different um, management styles and proficiencies. We can go ahead to the next slide. So we talked about power dynamics, and this is like the really quick power dynamic one-on-one. -on -one. There is so much depth to this. I'm not going to be able to cover all of it, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the important pieces of about managing up and managing self, and that when you're managing self and up, it's very important to understand the different forms of power dynamics um, that affects ourselves, the field, and the larger society. Now, some may feel like you're going into this like a detective and I don't have time to add this on as another layer, but trust me that when you start to understand the power dynamics within yourself, who you're managing up, your entire field and the larger society, I think it can only lend itself to you having a better experience. The one piece, the one form of power we never want to really deal with is power over. And power over is rooted, like I said, in um, white supremacist, that old school traditional power that this country has been founded on. And we're shifting from that to learn to lean more into power too. That's giving people the power to do things, make decisions um, and trust that it'll get done, power with. And that is when you're doing the things together and you're making um, decisions together because the people who are gonna be affected by the decisions should be at the table when the decisions are being made. And then the power within, and that's really your own personal power. And that goes really back to um, managing self. That's the power that, that's what's gonna be, that's your feel good. That's when you leave every day and you say, I have the power to control and dictate and determine how I'm gonna leave this place, how I'm going to interact with folk, and that's a very powerful uh, form of power that I think is often underutilized. Um, but the power over, as I mentioned, we wanna make sure we steer away from that because that is grounded in control, dominance, and fear. And if that's how anybody in this space is being managed, I just say, take it as a flag, identify it and know what you're dealing with because that is not necessarily the way that we wanna proceed forward um, if we want to have a healthy relationship and a healthy work experience. Then there's another layer of power, and that's what I call the faces of power. That's how power shows up in your workplace. There's some people that have visible power, and I've always made fun of people. I said, if you have to walk around any work environment saying what your title is, that means you've already lost power. I used to have, again, at, when I worked in education, I had a colleague and all they did was run around and say, I'm the principal, I'm the principal. I said, if everyone doesn't know that, that means you're really not the principal because you know, clearly you're, you're the person who has the power here. And then there's the hidden power, right? Those are the folks who network really well. They might not have a power position in the organization, but they draw people and they are kind of making those decisions behind the scenes. Um, and it's very important to know who those folks are in your organization um, because they hold power. Um, they might not hold the title, but they hold the power. And then there's this invisible power as well. Um, and that's like the power that's really out of our control. And a lot of times that can be dictated by society um, and things that are trending. Um, and we don't have control over that. I use COVID-19 um, as an example. COVID had a lot of power over a, a lot of our lives. That was nothing in our control. Um, it was a little virus going around, but it had a huge effect on how we moved, how decisions were made, how we presented. Um, so that was, even though it's not a person, I just use it as a slight example of an invisible power. And I'm trying to be mindful of time. Um, Mia, we can go on. So let's just reflect for a moment 
we'll throw a few things in the chat. Um, I can't see the reflection questions. Oh, there they go. <laughs> Thank you. So thinking about your role um, and you throw these in the chat, we'll take a couple of minutes. Um, and if someone has a pressing question or anything, think about a time when the forms or faces of power were in play as part of your role in management um, and identify and classify the forms and faces of power that were at play. And did these power dynamics present an equity issue? Because we'll see in a few moments how power can create an equity issue for your um, organization or agency. And how is power used to influence a final decision? And folks can just go ahead and throw a few of those things in the chat if you'd like. And I know this takes a couple of moments to really think about because our brains aren't necessarily wired to think of power and how it's being utilized. I've heard some things throughout the chat, throughout this um, training that I was like, oh, that was a, there was a power move here or a power dynamic. By a person saying we don't do lunch here, we all know that's illegal, but that's a power move, right? And if you think about it, um, who has really the influence to make the final decision on that? You do, because you know you have to eat. So, you know, there's a lot of, let me see. Will you please define power to? Yes, Emily. Power to is when you give someone the opportunity to make a decision. So an example may be, I, I like to use very simple examples because I don't like to get too heavy. So if, if you're sending out a, um, you're going to have a luncheon and you send out a survey to your folks and you say, we would like to know what everyone would like to eat. Um, you're giving the staff the power to make those decisions. Again, that's a very simple elementary example, but I'm trying to oversimplify it just to drive the point across. Um, but there are so many other complex ideas. May not be outwardly negative towards some workers, but may use it. Yes. That's a great point, Aiden. We see that happening over time. All the time we see that. Delaying things intentionally, that is a power. Yes. And me, I'm being mindful of time. I keep saying Mia. Allison, you're the one controlling the, the deck, right? <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately for you all, yes. <laughs> Get to have their own stuff. Yes. Lynn, that's a great point. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, even when we talk about um, emotional intelligence and neurodivergence. And you know, the unfortunate thing is, you know, some people move quickly along this pathway of understanding than others. Compensate, yes, oh my goodness. My, my, I'm cringing at some of what I'm hearing that you all are experiencing. And I'm so sorry. I really am genuinely sorry that some of you have to go through these awful things. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Mia and Allison. Yes, weaponizing funding is huge. I this I mean we I there could be like 15 trainings just with some of what I'm hearing in these um chats. Allison, let's go to the next slide because I know I want to be really mindful of time, but keep them keep them rolling in. And also allow this to be a venting space for you as well. Implicit biases, we hear the term all the time. We all have them. Don't be afraid of this word because we have to be able to know what it is. Everyone comes to the table with implicit biases. They run counter to people's conscious and express beliefs. And implicit biases are really a result of a long history um, and indoctrination into systemic racism and injustices. And again, this is another four to five hour training, just unpacking what implicit biases are 
but I just want to give you the quick and dirty version of what implicit bias look like and what to look out for. Um, and there, and implicit biases are, you know, they stereotype your confirming thoughts. And what really happens, it happens in our brain. And I did it the other day with a friend of mine. Um, I realized that, that I, I had an implicit bias. It wasn't harmful. It wasn't a major racial implicit bias. I assumed that a friend of mine was carrying something. I saw it um, based on this person's character and it was something else. And they said, Rakisha, why did you say that? Um, but anyway, we're not gonna go into it. So my point is we all have them. And in order to mitigate, mitigate an implicit bias, you have to have a heightened se sense of self-awareness. We all have implicit biases, but we must, it is our responsibility to um, reflect on that on our own. I don't know how many of you have safe spaces at your organizations and agencies. And I would say, if you have a safe space to talk about implicit biases or impact that as an organization, I would say do so. But if you don't, then find someone in on or out your agency where you can have these conversations and transparent conversations with, because they could be very emotional and dramatic and it can make you not feel good. Um, but it's very important to face them head on and to be able to have those transparent conversations. Next slide, Allison. I'm actually gonna jump in. There's a question in the chat if I can oh, I didn't read see it out to you, Rakisha, or in the yeah. Q&A. As I enter a new role higher in our organization structure, wanting more equitable power, how can I act as an agent to develop more power within, help share power to and with, and what kind of, um, what can I do to raise everybody up along with me? Wow, So, because uh, I can't see this one. Just read the first slide. They're entering a role as- okay. As I enter a new role higher in our organizational structure um, and then wanting to bring more equitable power, how can I act as an agent to develop more power within, help share power to and with, and then um, raise everybody up along with me? That's a great question. And I love that question. Um, and I always say that when, when we're implementing these diversity, equity, and belonging strategies, inclusion strategies, this, this, is, the, uh, this is a marathon and not a sprint. It, it's going to take time and we have to pick and choose and prioritize areas that we want to work on first. Um, and then another piece that I try to bring into my work is I try to model what my expectations are um, and then I call and I name it. So if I model something, I, I name what it is within spaces and then make suggestions or recommendations to further improve or expand um, to have certain structures in place for more equitable power. Um, and we're not talking a lot today about allyship, but you're talking about you want to act as an agent to develop more power within. So you're really becoming an ally for DEI work. Um, and that's how you start. You become that person. Now, I'm, I, I, and I'm, I can also you know, be sarcastic, but I say this facetiously. I, I, I don't recommend storming around the organization or agency, you know, in, in a hostile, because sometimes people don't hear or listen in that way. My approach has always been to bring whoever needs to be at the table to the table and call the thing, whatever it is. Um, and then also be open to providing suggestion. Because if you wanna be um, an agent to develop these structures, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. It's not about necessarily sitting back and waiting for someone to do it. You should be prepared to come to the table with some ideas and suggestions on how it can get done um, and continue to rally and be that ally at your organization, but give it time to um, manifest itself across the agency as well. EI, emotional intelligence. And this is a tricky one because there's so many as Allison mentioned earlier, there's so many ways of thinking about this. I've talking about some of the four um, competencies of emotional intelligence, and we're really just going to touch the service, surface. But it's important to have the ability to perceive, control, and evaluate emotions. Now, I do want to mention, we also have to be very mindful with emotional intelligence 
about neurodivergence, that people's brains work differently. People um, process information, people conduct their business differently, people think about the work differently. And just because um, it may not be the typical way or the way you would do things, doesn't mean it's the wrong way to do things. So I like to bundle emotional intelligence around thinking about an awareness of yourself, um, having self-management, how you manage yourself, how you manage your emotions. We saw Zoe, she blurted out this thing about her colleague. Um, and, and, and if so, put things in place. You know, I've gotten emails that I've read and I was so angry. I realized that I didn't even read it properly. And I had already drafted a response and the response sounded crazy. And I said, let me put this in the draft folder because I need to calm down. I need to manage myself. I need to manage my emotion. And then I went back and read the email. And I was like, wow, it didn't really say what I thought it was saying. I was already, I was just too angry to read what it really meant. So managing self may look like that. And you all can create your own tools on what to do. Is it breathing? Is it whatever it is or strategies that you need to do to manage yourself? Um, and relationship management. How are you managing the relationship between yourself, your colleagues, your, your, um, your boss or your supervisor? Um, and then again, like I mentioned earlier, the social awareness, always wait before you respond. Yes, always wait before you. And really take them, and it's, some people are so afraid with, of silence. Some people think you have to respond to things immediately. I am personally a processor. And sometimes I've been in spaces and people have asked me a question and I say, you have to give me a moment to process because that's my new neurodivergent piece, right? And people used to see neurodivergence as um, disabilities. They're not, it's just people's brains work differently and we need to respect and honor that. And it's not that I'm asking people to become brain surgeons or um, psychiatrists, but leave space for people to think and process information um, the way that they think and process it and embrace that those differences as opposed to um, poking fun or saying what's wrong with such and such. They, it took them four hours to read an email. Sometimes people need to process the email that they're reading and it may take them some time. Um, not everyone thinks the same way that we do. I do practice silent words, which help. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, thank you, George, for sharing that. Wonderful. And I'm gonna move on, we have five minutes and I know I'm talking a lot, I'm sorry, Allison, let's go on to the next slide. So again, before we um, leave out, I just wanna give you a few things to reflect about. But now we're talking about reflecting and processing. You just got a lot of stuff in a very short period of time, which I hope was helpful. But to end up on our reflections about diversity, equity, and inclusion, as we manage self and manage up, I want you to think about a relationship between an implicit bias and um, emotional intelligence. Are they related? Can they connect? And how do you see them connecting? And how can emotional intelligent competencies have an impact on effective management? I've heard some crazy things that you guys wrote in those charts, and it doesn't sound like some of your managers are very emotionally intelligent, especially if they're behaving in ways that are toxic and not healthy to the agency and organization. And where have you seen implicit bias play out in your work? And what role did emotional intelligence play? And we can just throw some remarks in the chat before I hand it back over to my colleagues um, to close out. And thank you all, I'm, I'm reading the chat. I really do hope it was helpful. Um, Mia, I know you want to have folks um, look at the evaluation scan. Yeah, so um, if we get through this quickly, we might be able to fit another question or two in. Um, but before people hop off, we really ask that they take two to three minutes to fill out our post webinar evaluation survey. It's very short. We use that feedback to improve the series, to keep it going 
Um, and also if you have ideas for other webinar topics that you'd like to explore, please put those in the survey too. We take a look, we read them, and we take them very seriously. Um, I'll also just say too that if you or your organization or team are interested in diving more deeply into any of the topics we talked about today, we encourage you to have your program director or executive director request individualized TTA. Um, and the way they do that, as we mentioned earlier in the webinar, is they go to our TARP catalog, um, they click a service or topic, and then they fill out a request form. We're happy to provide individualized support in those areas. Um, the only thing we need is the request form. Um, and thank you all for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to hear from you and to read all of your comments in the chat. Is there anything, Rakesha, Allison, we wanted to end on? Any pieces I missed? I'm reading really great feedback in the chat. We appreciate that too. Put it in the eval, very insightful topic. Thank you. We hear a lot of, oh, evaluation link. I'll put it in the chat again. Thanks, Mia. I was trying to do that. I'm not sure if I keep hitting, anyway, that'd be great. And I'll also put in the chat again, the slides. After this um, webinar, you all will receive an email that has a link to our catalog, a link to the TTA request form, link to the slides, link to a recording of this webinar. All of that is accessible. Rachel, I see you hopped on. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, just thank you so much. Thank you, Rakesha, Mia, and Allison. Uh, it's wonderful to see this feedback. Stay tuned. We will be emailing. As Mia said, we'll send you all this information. I also just want to do a quick plug. The OVS conference is taking place in Albany in August, and registration opens on Monday. So ovs.my.gov forward slash conference will give you more information about that. If you are interested in more information about personalized training, that's ovs.my.gov forward slash T-T-A-R-P. And I've sent it in the chat a few times, but we'll put it in the recap email as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye, Rakisha. Nice to see bye. you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye, Rachel.